I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in this uh, great workshop today. And I'd like to tell you about our new ultra high resolution brain system, the Neuro Explorer or NX. So first, a little background on PET. We haven't heard about too much at PET at this conference yet, except for George's talk. Um, we know PET is based on using biologically relevant molecules labeled with fluorine 18 or carbon 11, typically. With those short half-lives, allows us to do repeat studies. And with the great PET scanners we have, we can be quantitative. That is, we can make an assay of the radioactivity in units, becquerels per ml. And what makes it more powerful is to take the measurements we get of the images with measurements of something the input function using tracer kinetic modeling to extract physiological images that relate to blood flow or related to specific binding of the target. Now, at Yale, we've been doing high resolution brain pet imaging now for quite some time with a large variety of different tracers, allowing us to produce images with very different distributions, looking at serotonin transporters or receptors, kappa receptors, or more recently, our synaptic density marker that binds to SV2A. So we've been doing this with our HRT. That's a high resolution system. It, was, it is still probably the state of the art for high resolution main pet, but it's an old system. It was designed more than 20 years ago. We installed ours in 2005 at, at Yale. We've done 4,500 pet studies with probably 50 different tracers. And, and we're very active as 50 NIH grants that do brain pet at Yale. For most of these, we're doing dynamic scans, arterial blood sampling, hardware motion correction as we detect motion but we're probably operating at a three millimeter resolution about that, at that stage. And what have we learned from all that time? Well, we've learned that radioactive counts are our limiting case, but we can only collect so many counts, even with a high resolution, high sensitivity machine. The images we get are therefore kind of noisy because of low counts. And then when we want to apply those kinetic modeling to get parametric images, they get even noisier. So invariably some kind of filtering, noise reduction, or maybe deep learning now is needed. In other words, we can't usually work at the system's best possible resolution. The other thing we've learned, of course, is people move. And even to try to get high resolution, it's just not meaningful without great motion correction. Now, our collaborators on this project come from UC Davis and United Imaging, and they've built the Explorer, the two meter long PET scanner. And what they've learned in working with the Explorer recently is that by having exceptionally high sensitivity, that is with a large field of view, you get spectacular signal to noise ratio in the images. And that lets you create a parametric image here of a pat like FDGKI with no smoothing necessary. And it also provides exceptional time sampling, temporal sampling in the data, here showing at 100 millisecond time frames the distribution of a radio tracer here throughout the whole body into the lungs and ultimately distributed throughout. So we're combining this information that we've learned from both sites with lots of brain imaging at Yale and lots of whole body super high sensitivity at Davis. And that puts together our rationale for what we'd like to build in our next generation dedicated brain pet. We'd like to focus on sensitivity. First, we need the sensitivity to push the images to highest resolution as they do with the Explorer. We'd like it to improve our quantification, whether that lets us scan later, for example, with carbon 11 tracers due to the 20 minute half-life, or for targets with low Bmax, where the signal is intrinsically small. We'd like to measure dynamics like neurotransmitter release. So we need very high sensitivity to have very low noise data. And of course, if we get that low noise, we can also measure small changes over time in disease, where maybe you're changing one or 2% per year. We need great sensitivity to measure that well. Or we can lower the injected dose that may, that may allow us to do more pediatric imaging, or perhaps let us do more scans with more tracers as we do with Alzheimer's disease. But sensitivity is not enough. We've got to have high resolution, higher than what we have now. We'd like to look at small structures in the brain, whether we're looking at midbrain nuclei with different monoamines, or we're looking at something like entorhinal cortex early in dementia. We'd like to avoid the partial volume effects and really importantly distinguish atrophy effects from losses of the targets that we're looking at. That's very important in neurodegenerative disorders to understand which, what is changing what. We'd also like to measure the input function, the time curve of, of radioactivity in the blood. And right now, with a, you know, we tried to do that in HRT and it really wasn't good enough, but we also need that exceptional motion tracking. So we wanna take advantage of the experience that we had at Yale in order to achieve that resolution. So our goal here is to build the Neuro Explorer, managing the Neuro Focus with what we've learned from the Explorer. Our goal is with our commercial partner, United Imaging, to produce a fully functional system with at least tenfold higher sensitivity than the HRT, resolution below two millimeters, continuous motion correction. And if we can pull, pull all this off and we have high confidence we can, 
to really dramatically expand the scope of brain pet protocols, both for healthy brain as well as for pathophysiology. All right, so let me walk you through our grant that we recently funded in September. Aim one is really to build the system, to develop the NeuroExplore, driven by our work with United Imaging. And this is the overview of the system. There'll be a CT and the PET. They will be separate, in fact, to allow us to position ourselves between the two machines. Again, we're going to make a 50 centimeter effective a large diameter, axial diameter with a 50 centimeter opening. The crystals will start about 1.5 millimeters with 18 millimeter depth to get good resolution. We're going to have an excellent time of flight, 250 picoseconds to give us more sensitivity, but we're also going to use depth of interaction. And that will hopefully allow us to measure the image drives input function from the carotids and cameras for motion track. So let me walk through some of these. One of the key things we've learned on the Explorer is the critical importance of depth of interaction. So this is the axial extent of the scanner, and you have a coincidence that works on this axial direction there. Depending on where the event occurs in the depth along the crystal, the, the, the event can blur out dramatically. So when you have a long axial extent, you get a much reduction in, in the axial resolution, as well as the loss in transverse resolution. So excellent depth of interaction is critical. How are we going to do that? Well, the nature of our crystal with an optical bridge that's going to go across two SIPMs, by measuring the relative light that goes on either side, we're going to be able to deduce the location along the DOI. And our initial data suggests we're going to have about a four millimeter resolution along this 18 millimeter depth. It also provides a second benefit that if we have intercrystal scatter, which actually happens about 30% of the time, by measuring the two events and by measuring their relative depth, we can anticipate what the first interaction point will be. Again, improving resolution. Now, another issue is by to maximize the sensitivity, we want to position the patient in the center of the field of view. We want a long field of view, 50 centimeters actually, and our problem runs into is shoulders. And so what we've designed is a partial shoulder ring. The last ring in the scanner will have this notch out to allow the shoulders to be placed in, which will center the brain in the center of the field of view. And that combination of intrinsic sensitivity, the long axial field of view, as well as great time of flight, we predict that tenfold higher sensitivity. And here we're considering the raw profiles of sensitivity between the NX and our current HRT, big increase in the center, even bigger on the edge where the carotids are, which will really be important to be able to measure that field, that field of view. So let me move on to AIM-2, which describes the imaging and the software, the algorithms that go on. And this is led by Jimmy Chi at, at UC Davis. And so we think about our normal pipeline. We have a quantitative the markers of our system and the model. We will take that data through our motion models and our tracer kinetic models with that goal of producing parametric images. And this whole pipeline is important to think about when we go from list mode events into the final production images there. So we can use all of these ideas of the physical statistical models and now more recently, of course, deep learning methods to improve along the way. So how does the novel features of the NX affect what we're doing? Well, the depth of interaction, that's going to be one thing new that we're going to have to deal with. That's going to let us get uniform resolution throughout space, depending on the angle of incidence of the different events, as well as improving our axial resolution. The shoulder cutouts will also produce an issue. The raw data down at this level would produce artifacts, and we're really looking to deep learning to reduce or eliminate those artifacts. We also know that by having a large number of counts, we should be able to push the resolution even further by adding models for positron range, non-collinearity, as well as incorporating those intercrystal scatter designs. But ultimately, we're really interested in minimizing the noise because that's that challenge wherever we go, whether we're doing very late with rapidly decaying tracers. And the right regularization is the key. And our, really, our goal is to be able to maintain uniform resolution of the images over both space within the brain and over time over the kinetics. And that's going to let us get consistent quantification. And we have lots of experience in our multiple groups to be able to achieve these goals. Now, in terms of preliminary studies before the system is completed, we're using the Big Brain Atlas from Alan Evans, which gives us the cytoarchitecture of the brain at very high resolution. And now he's going to be adding into that the neuroreceptor distributions here with autoradiography. And so the combined measurements of the anatomy as well as the pharmacology is going to let us know what our ground truth would be in the best case the simulation data. But we also have to do this with phantoms. There are some very interesting newer phantoms trying to get the real 3D architecture of the brain better than the old-fashioned 3D Hoffman phantom that we've been using for years. And we're also interested in building dynamic carotid phantoms so that we can begin to image the carotid and being able to test that measure. There's also some very cool novel designs in phantoms these days that we'll look into to really test the accuracy and precision of our system. 
Now, I mentioned head motion is critical. It's been a huge topic of conversation in PET for a long time. We've been using this Viker for tracking head motion, which requires mounting a tool on the top of the patient's head. It works well. We have a lot of experience with it, but it is still limiting there. And so many other approaches have been doing now more data driven, but the focus we're going to use is going to be looking at stereo cameras, which we think is the smartest way to be able to produce a reliable measure independent of count level. We're going to do this with stereo vision we're using structured light. This is a off the shelf machine that we can be building right now and that we've already begun the test. It's already MR compatible as well. And it really lets us play with all of the optimization we're going to need to validate the, the continuous measurement of the 3D position of the patient's head. And right now we have the luxury of, since we're already using this on our HRT with the Vicra, we can do the, literally the head to head comparison. And that work is already beginning at Yale using the stereo vision system, being able to move that and compare that in existing scanners. So we'll get ahead of the curve before the NX is completed. Now, I mentioned imaging the input function. Here's an image of what you can see for the carotid input function at the very early part of the injection of a particular tracer binds the muscarinic M1 tracer. We'd like to measure that to avoid arterial sampling to get this image-derived input function, but we have challenges. The carotids are small, four or five millimeter in diameter, and the contrast will be different both at different times and, and it, depending on the nature of the tracer. So we have a lot of work to do. Some we can start now with, with the phantoms that I mentioned or with simulations. But ultimately, we're going to be validating that with human data using arterial samples. Now, here in the preparation for that, the Explorer data is very valuable because even when they're doing brain studies, the carotids and the aorta are always in the field of view. So with the aorta, which is not limited by partial line effects due to its size, we have a measurement of what the blood would be and can begin to compare what the relative values that we will get in this kind of system. And so if we have very good image resolution, of course, very good sensitivity, we'll begin to have an idea of how that would work in a large body of data. That will help us be ready when the system arrives. But if these are not good enough, we've also planned to include some high resolution inserts that can be mounted near the level of the carotids. Here's some examples of some of the detector technology we may use. And our now goal is to be able to incorporate those into the NX, which is designed to allow for this addition, to be able to include coincidence between the scanner and between the insert and to avoid artifacts there. So let me briefly go into the final aim, which will be to actually demonstrate this in human systems. We have a lot of different applications with many different tracers, all to be able to look at paradigms that either we have been doing, we wanna do better, or new paradigms in healthy controls. For example, we wanna first demonstrate that the noise actually does get reduced. And we're gonna do this by bringing the tracers into equilibrium, here the MGLUR5 tracer FPEB, or our synaptic density marker here with UCBJ or SYNVEST1. And that lets us measure the variability within, in this case, regions or down to a pixel level. We'll take the same subjects, scan them in both scanners, look at the ratio of the variance, and be able to say, did we get our tenfold increase in human beings? And that will test that we're getting this across the entire scope of the data set. We'll also go to small regions and see how reliable that'll be. And that'll be with multiple scans. We'll be looking at the Substantia Nigra, for example, with the PHNO tracer that we can visualize here on our HRT pretty well. We'll be able to do better on the NX or looking at the RAFA nucleus with something like a serotonin transporter. And really, we'll look at the real world variability, which right now is pretty poor due to the low sensitivity for a small region. We're also really interested in looking at neurotransmitter release. This is something that our group has spent a lot of time on. Here, we spent a lot of time measuring dopamine release. For example, here, looking at smoking induced dopamine release in the striatum using carbon 11 raclopride. And this is with patient smoking in the scanner to be able to do that. We'd like to do this in the cortex, but there's less dopamine with a small with a stress test, really to push the envelope. And we've been simulating that at this point where we're looking at a dynamic change in dopamine. This reflects the positive the ability to successfully classify depending on the magnitude the effect with a bigger dopamine signal in the upper right. The HRT is marginal to be able to produce this. The NX big improvement, at least according to simulations, will demonstrate that in reality. And finally, combining the two where we're looking in a small region, periaqueductal gray, we're looking at the pain response here now with an activation. We'll use capsaicin and we'll use carbon 11 carfentanil to do baseline scans or brief capsaicin pain stimulus. Again, we can look at a hopefully a large opioid release, but in a very small region. And we'll leave that the combination of the technology we're using for dynamic neurotransmitters and the NX's high sensitivity and high resolution will allow us to robustly detect this, which we cannot do now. So here's the timeline for construction. Here we are early in 2021. We have some additional uh, design work that we need to do, which will be done in the coming months. Construction begins. 
the delivery will be done to Yale by the end of 2022, and then we can embark on the AIM-3 work to be able to test and evaluate that system. So I'd like to tremendously acknowledge NIBIB for the U01, our three teams at Yale, at UC Davis, and at United Imaging Healthcare. And instead of having a list of names, let's have a list of pictures for our big team to be able that, that we've been having some very exciting and reliable, regular task groups and big group meetings to be able to move that forward. And for somebody who's been doing brain pet for a very long time, I couldn't be more excited than to be able to take this vision of the NX and turn it into reality with this great team. So I'll thank you very much for your attention and take questions.